Hey everybody, it's Dale Jr. back again for another episode of the Dale Jr. Download here on this Wednesday. Our guest segment brought to you by Ally here in the Bojangles studio. Jefferson Hodges is our guest. All right, we're ready for our guest segment brought to you by Ally. Do it right. Episode 516. We're going to talk about why Jefferson Hodges. This is probably not a, a name that you recognize, but I always get asked about how to get involved in NASCAR. And I think Jefferson's story about how he was able to get involved in the sport and all the different paths that it took him down is really uh, compelling to me. But he also literally helped us get Junior Motorsports off the ground. Back when Junior Motorsports first started, we were a solely a late model stock team. He tells the story of how we grew into an Xfinity race team, and he was at the controls of getting all the operations going. So I'm uh, looking forward to reliving some of those memories and also hearing just the sacrifices that Jefferson had to make uh, to be able to get into this sport and, and stay and make it work. So uh, appreciate uh, Ally and everything they do. Uh, let's get right to it and get Jefferson in the room. Get up on that mic. All right. We're going for a ride. All right. Um, Jefferson Hodges is here on the Dale Jr. Download, and um, <clears throat> I wanted to tell people – this is the way I've been teeing up this show. It's like we I know your story, and, and it's a great one. We're going to hear it. But um, I get asked all the time how to get in racing. How yep. do you get in racing? How do you get in racing? How do, what do I do? What do I do? And I think that you're a great example or story of this is how you do it. Okay. This is the sacrifices that you're going to have to make. This is – this you know, your path is not going to be perfect, and uh, and it will be with – uh, challenges. Everybody thinks you turn in a resume and, and they call you and you show up and off you go. Yeah. Not, yeah. Like, not, not quite that easy, is it? No, I've got one from Penske that said thanks but no thanks 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yeah. And now um, now you're a big player over there at Penske helping them have a, a ton of success. But before we get there, um, I wanted to say thanks for coming in, Jefferson. I uh, saw you in LA a couple weeks ago and I was, we got to talking and I was like, man, I think it'd be great to get you on the show and talk about where you where you've been and 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 your story and plus um one thing that's unique about you is you helped us get junior merge Sports started yeah uh, i'd like to think so yeah you yeah. did and so uh you were you're a massive uh we we leaned on you uh when it came to to put our program together and i want to talk about that as well but first off man from williamsburg virginia um a lot of late model stock racing happening up and around that area but uh what was your what was your original connection to motorsport so I'm from a semi-racing family. My uncle raced growing up, not anyone in my immediate family. Yeah. So kind of grew up in and around Langley. Um, was a huge Elton Sawyer fan when I was a kid. Yeah. And, you know, his cars were always beautiful and clean, and, and he raced clean, and, and I just thought it was, like, pretty interesting the way he did it. Uh, but, you know, just kind of kept up with my uncle a lot, and, and as his career progressed and I got a little bit older, I, you know, I could start driving myself to the race shop and, and helping him a little bit. And, and, you know, I'm sure some of it was, he was just being nice cause he was family, but like he really started kind of leaning on me and, and, you know, I, you know, I remember the first time he took my advice and, and tried something and it worked and was like, dang, this guy's been, you know, winning my whole life. And do you remember what that advice was? Yeah, we were, he was, uh, he was letting squaring up a rear end mess with him, you know, just cause had struggle and to figure out like why he couldn't get it square. And yep. so you know it's like back then it was a three-step process and each step would mess up one of the other ones and you just kind of had to keep getting it closer and closer and um i just that gave me that sense of like i can do this yeah like i can do this better than somebody else so i'm gonna do it so um you're <clears throat> helping your uncle and going to the racetrack and getting introduced to racing um did you ever want to drive no no um you worked with uh so was langley sort of the only track you went to there for a while did you go to other racetracks yeah i went to south side on friday night they'd run and that was before you know southampton came along but that was like after i had already started kind of doing it for a living um but langley was always home mm -hmm. you know it was where my grandparents lived really close to it so we could kind of like go down there um and you know spend the weekend they lived on the bay on the water and you could, you know, you could do a little boat and do a little racing at night and kind of just, it all went together. Um, but that's, that's where I got the first, you know, taste of it. It was like, my yeah. dad took me to Southside every Friday night and, and, uh, you know, Langley was like the, 
the rabbit for behaving. If I was, if I behaved and I was good and my grades were where they needed to be, then, then we got to go there and, yeah. and like, you know, see some, some better stuff. So what, <clears throat> Rick Townsend is a, a really cool dude, uh, that me and you both know really well. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, I, I think we'll learn how big of an influence he was for you, but mm-hmm. I, 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 um, always thought he uh was such a great guy uh how how did you meet rick rick is a rick is, as we would you know as as we would understand him or at least as i would know him was a chassis builder yep um but he was more than that um yeah. so talk about rick and and getting to know him and how you ended up over there so rick was a legend in virginia in all the late mile stock car world and um you know, kind of had like this whole other path even before he came to Virginia. He was, you know, him and Mike Beam were were with Butch Lindley when Butch was just tearing up short track racing all over the place. And, um, he, you know, he had this idea to build these, what was called a late mile stock car. And, you know, they started in 1982 at Old Dominion Speedway up in Manassas, Virginia. So there was really, at the time, there was two people that built them, Emmanuel Cervakis and Rick and his partner, Ricky Dennis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, just kind of growing up in that area, it was, you know, you either had one or the other. You were either a Cowboys fan or a Redskin fan. Like, you couldn't be both. Right. Um, and, you know, just through coincidence, one of the cars that my uncle had when I was younger, Rick had built. And I kind of just always remembered it. It was just better looking than the other ones. Like, the, you know, the welds and the detail and the little things were nicer. And, you know, he would wreck it and, and it would go to Rick. And when it would come back, it looked better than it did before he wrecked it. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I graduated from high school, went to college, stayed close to Richmond. It wasn't really the plan. Um, I had all intentions of doing a semester close to home and then transferring to Virginia Tech. And in the meantime, I found Rick's shop. It was close to school. And, like, just pure coincidence. Drove really? by it, saw the sign, and was like, ah, that's where I belong. So I went in and, and introduced myself. And I'll never forget it. I didn't actually meet Rick the first time I went there. I met Ricky Dennis. Yep. And I told him who my uncle was. And he said, man, I'm sorry. He was kind of just, you know, right. the way to break the ice. Yeah. Um, and I asked for a job. And I offered to come in at night and clean the shop and empty trash cans and do whatever, um, you know, just for that opportunity. And they said, well, I mean, we're not gonna make you do that, but we are looking for somebody. And they needed someone to cut pipe, notch it, bend it for these roll cages that they were building around the corner. And, you know, looking back on it, I've been better off emptying the trash cans. It was tough work, but, um, yeah, they gave me my start and they were both Rick and Ricky both were just as adamant about me finishing college as, my parents were. Um, I still lived at home when I was doing this, and that was kind of the deal, like, you're going to finish school. Um, so I worked part-time for them for quite a while until I finished, you know, and, and graduated. And then once I did that, it was game on. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, what kind of person was Rick? I like I like to talk about him because he was yeah. – he was a special guy. Yeah, his story needs to be told more. Rick was like one of the coolest people you could ever meet. He was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Like there was, he's bar none, one of the smartest race car people I've ever met in my life. There was nobody's car that he touched that he didn't make better, right? Like he made he made people that raced winners and he made winners champions all over the East Coast. Um, but there was something about him that he – wanted to share all this knowledge you where a lot of these guys especially back then they they might have known everything that rick knew but they wanted to keep it close to their pocket and and they didn't want to share it and they were afraid that you know the next guy was going to replace them or outdo them and and rick was just wanted to share with whoever would pick up the phone and call him you didn't even have to have one of his cars like i mean that was his way of selling stuff was making somebody else's race car better yeah um but he didn't care I mean, he obviously cared because he had a business and he needed to pay the bills. But making money wasn't why Rick was in it. He just loved racing and he loved helping people. And and I don't, I never really got a straight answer out of him what it was about me that that he latched onto. But I mean, it it was unbelievable, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be anywhere without him. So you worked there for about four years. At the same time, um, you're you started calling. Tommy Baldwin. Yeah. Right. Who's working at Junior Dunleavy's team. Yep. 
what, how did you get his number? So they there was you know like in Richmond there was three games in town right you either worked for Rick Emanuel Cervakis and if you went Cup racing you worked for Mister Dunleavy, um, and there was there was two guys that worked with me at Townsend. Um, they were they were great fabricators, um, still very close friends of mine, and they both left and went to work for Junie. And honestly, it really hadn't crossed my mind at the time. I was still pretty young. I was like 19 years old, barely 20. Um, and I thought, if they can do it, I can do it. I just need a chance. I yeah. just need someone to give me a chance. So looking back on it, the fact that Tommy, we went on break at Townsend at 945 every morning. And every Monday morning at 945, I would call Tommy Baldwin and ask him for an interview. And I'm still to this day convinced that the only reason he gave me the interview is so I would stop calling him. <laughs> um, but think about it now. There was no private planes back then. Junie was barely flying commercial back then. And this guy was at work at 945 on Monday mornings, no matter where they raced. And like now that I look back on it and think about it, it's like that is more impressive than than even, you know, my opportunity. Just the work ethic that that dude has is crazy. And he still has it. Like, um, but yeah, went up there and and uh, it's kind of turned out to be a funny story. I was super nervous, like went in there and like, you know, it's cup racing, man. It's like the coolest thing in the world. And we sit down and we talk for a little bit and we go in the back and he said, I'm going to give you a welding test. And, and here's the deal. If I can weld better than you, don't ever call me again. Yeah. If you weld better than me, then you got a job. So we go back there to the welder. And I had my welding helmet, my glove, and like, if nothing else, if you welded for Rick Townsend, you're, you can weld better than anybody, yeah. bar none. Uh -huh. So I knew it. Like I had it in the bag. Had like it. you got, I got you, <laughs> I got you right where I want you now. So he, you know, he made a valid attempt, and and then I, you know, then I did mine, and and I got my job, yeah. and it was cool. Damn. Yeah. How long did you work there? About a year and a half. Yeah. So I worked there. All of 98, half of 99. Who's 90, the driver? Dick Trickle drove in 98, had Heilig Myers. It was the last year of that. Um, and, you know, at the end of the season, the Heilig Myers company ended up shutting down um, very soon after that, and Trickle went on his way. And and uh, after that, it was kind of like, you know, they had the Duke's Mayonnaise deal, the Sowers company, and Hutt Strickland drove it. Hutt was a great dude, and he was a ton of fun. Yep. But you could kind of see the writing on the wall. <clears throat> you know, the the – um everything was pushing towards charlotte and there wasn't a line of sponsors out the door to come you know sponsor the 90 car in richmond virginia so kind of looked around and you got 30 really talented guys and they've all got cup racing on their resume now and there's not a lot of other people in richmond that do and it was like i got to beat these guys back to work for rick before oh. the floodgates open and this place shuts down you needed to go back to rick townsend's yep. because yep. you thought there'd be a heavy competition for I, that yeah and i knew there would that no. or they were all gonna have you know the, the sun might move to charlotte to try to pursue that's opportunities right. there and and charlotte to me still wasn't <laughs> in the conversation because even though i was pretty well rounded from working for rick it was still at a late model level you know we built some xfinity cars some trucks and stuff like that but like my niche was late model racing, was short track racing. Um, and and working for Junie, you get to do a lot of things. I was a shock builder, changed front tires, set cars up, was a fabricator. But you come down here and you start telling people in Charlotte that in the late 90s, and they're going to be like, yeah, right. Because yeah. everybody kind of had a thing that they did. And, and I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to move to Charlotte. Um, away from everything I knew sure. just to put rear windows in a stock car for the rest of my life, like yeah. as cool as it would have been. So I made a little attempt at it. I talked to some people down here. Like, you know, Ricky Rudd was obviously local legend, knew some people that knew mm -hmm. him, came down here and talked to him and Watto Wilson at the time and um, applied at Penske just because it was Penske and, and um, you know, either didn't get what I thought was right for me or didn't get anything. And – went back to work for Rick. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of the deal with the him and I is like, I want to be able to do this, stand on my own two feet. And that's what we did. What do you remember working with, uh, with, uh, Dick Trickle? I, he was a pretty interesting guy. Like, I mean, he was, you know, he was kind of the guy that would, 
which it was a little bit different back then. It wasn't, you know, the drivers weren't as private. They were, you know, they stay at the hotel with you and they kind of ride around, but uh, he just wanted to be one of the guys in race. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, like a lot of the rumors you hear about the briefcase with the hard candy and the extra cigarettes, it's like real. they were true. Yeah. They're real. Um, but the, the coolest Dick trickle story I have 1998 was the 50th anniversary of NASCAR, right? So they changed the logo for like the first time. Now they do it all the time, but now it, that was the first time we had ever seen a massive logo change and it had the 50th anniversary and the gold and <clears throat> the last race of the season, he had two different fire suits depending on whatever the, uh, paint on the car was. One was solid white and one was black. The white one he gave me after the last race, like really? took it off, balled it up, handed it to me and said, here, thanks. And it's like, I still have it to this day. Like, it's just cool. Like yeah. it's got the little zipper, you know, where the cigarettes and the lighter <laughs> lived. It's got his name on it. Yeah. It's the 50th anniversary. And like, it just, <clears throat> to be that young, 98. So I was 20 and, and to have did you have the, did you have the lighter inside the car? The lighter was in the car. Yep. Where, how, how? It was on the door. <clears throat> so what was the, what was the media reaction when when you got when you went to the race shop to work there the first time and somebody said yep uh got the checklist uh yep got the lighter <laughs> in there like no race car no other, that's the only race car in the history of nascar yeah in those days at least that had a lighter in it yeah and i don't think mr dunlevy was a huge fan of it so it was kind of like the unspoken thing you Ooh. did for for trickle right yeah um but yeah, it was true, you know, and I'd seen people that had taped gum on their dash or different sure. little things, but, yeah. but yeah, that was, uh, it was real. And, Wild. um, you know, obviously there was places that he didn't use it like a road course where he had his hands full right. or something, but, um, didn't think about that. Yeah. Open face helmets. And, and he did actually convert to a closed face helmet for a couple races, like later in that year. Yep. And it, it kind of kiboshed that, but, um, it was real. <laughs> it was real. That's awesome. Yeah, I got to hang around him when I was young. We, uh, one of my friends' dad worked on the '66 Tropodic car that he drove for Kelly Arbrill, and he was so nice. I mean, a couple punk kids, you know, 13, 12, yeah. 14 years old, being in the way, he couldn't have been nicer. Um, and and he, uh, he had the briefcase with the underwear and and cigarettes and Reese cups. Yeah, I was gonna leave the underwear part out. Yeah, you can, you can say. Yeah, <laughs> and a pair of white tighties in there. That's right. Um, so when so what does are you there till the last day? No, no. You left before Dunleavy shut. I did. Yeah, Junior, Junior did. shut down. Yep. Um, and you went back to Rick's. I did. Right. Yep. So when you go back to Rick, are you you just slot right back into where you were? You got a better position? Uh, a little bit of both. And one one thing about leaving Junies, Tommy Baldwin left at the end of '98, right? And it was nothing against the people that came in after him, but they weren't Tommy Baldwin. Yeah. Um, and I felt like. For a year, I was drinking from a water fountain, like a big garden hose, like just learning so much. So it wasn't just about leaving Junie or or beating the mad rush that I did see coming. It was also, I was too young to not, not have anyone to look up to, not have anyone to learn from. And by no means am I saying that I knew everything. Yeah. I was just surrounded by a bunch of people like me. Um, so I knew... Yeah, I go back to work for Rick and just go back to learning. Yeah, so you go back to work with uh, with Rick and um, it said you worked with Robert Powell. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm surprised by that because I grew up racing Robert at the beach mm -hmm. in ninety in ninety three four five six. Robert raced at Florence in the beach every week, and his you know his dad ran Somerville and. Uh, Florence Motor Speedway, and Robert lived around that area. How is he? And I know he did in the in the earlier '90s or late '80s run a run a uh, bush race or two. So I know he got out of that mm -hmm. little bubble down there in, in in Myrtle Beach in that area. But how does he end up driving for Rick? So he only ran two races for us, but it was a really good record. The two that he ran. Yeah. So what happened was. Whoever he had driven for before, he had lost his ride, but he owned the motor. So he came he came to Rick and Ricky and wanted had a motor and wanted us to build him a car to go to Martinsville. And um, just like that. Just like that. And 
truth be told, it turned out really well, so he might deny it, but Ricky Dennis wasn't a huge fan of it. Right. Ricky was the one that made sure we all got paid every Friday. And it's definitely something, uh, looking back on it, and him and I have talked about this, I, I didn't understand how hard that was to do when you own a small business until I had to worry about you know paying people. Uh, but Rick and I were like, yeah, we're going to build this car. We've only got like two weeks to do it. We'll work all day. We'll work all night. And like, I just thought the world of Rick, like if I could hang around him for 23 hours a day, like I was going to do it. So we drug the metal out of the rack and, and that was kind of the deal Ricky made with us was like, you can't take anything out of production. You can't take anything off the shelf. If you're going to do this, build it all. Like everything else is already inventory and has yeah. a place. And you know, at the end of the day it had a price tag on it. So we built this car and we barely made it to the racetrack, um, went to Martinsville and thing was lightning quick um what was so special about it it was um it, there was a, a guy named lee McAllister had come with robert and him and rick had kind of lee was like brilliant when it came to short track racing and he and rick put their head together and redesigned the whole front clip it was like nothing that you had ever seen and there were so many attempts at what the right heights were that we ultimately ended up like welding washers over all these slots and random holes because they kept working on it, getting it better, getting it better. And there was no pull downs or anything like, you know, you're talking plumb bobs and chalk on the floor. And it was like, when it got all done, you know, we welded washers around all these slots to like make what would be the hole on the final product. Yeah. And, um, it, it just worked and it was, it was new and it was awesome. And the car was beautiful. And, you know, we had, you know, over there trying to build this thing as fast as we could and weigh in every part that we put on it and just kind of just super conscious of it and got a lot of buy-in from some of the other guys in the shop and you know when it was all said and done it was like the morning before you used to go there and you'd park your trailer like the day before and you'd have to be in line the day before that and it was a whole event and we didn't leave till like the night of yeah drove all night to get there and you know it was awesome parked in the back and parked yeah. in the back didn't have anything we had to borrow jack stands and a oh, jack danny edwards jr yeah like it was a it was a thing and you won the race yeah beat him bad like, really it was impressive yeah he started ninth he uh he raced up front you know back then they had to invert i got inverted back to seventh it didn't take him very long to get back to the front and just you know just ran away with it yeah. um and then past tech which back then was really hard <laughs> and, and rick and i didn't know a whole lot about the motor at the time you know it was like Went robert sure. powell had brought it and you know it was like you know Robert Powell kind of wasn't necessarily always the straightest shooter in the tech shed, sure. so it was like, Ugh. where but, you ran another race with him? Where was that? Myrtle Beach, the four hundred. Oh, yeah, and prob that's his wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. his wheelhouse. Yep. So he probably, it, yeah, he ran really good there. What year was this? Ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah, so really? like I did the World Six Hundred with yeah. Junie, and that was the last race I ran with wow. him, and then kind of went back. Yeah. And and we started working on this little project. The two races with Robert Powell, man. Yep. That, that, I love when that name comes up in, in 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 a conversation because I spent many years chasing him. Yeah. Around the beach. He's a beast. Yeah. He was good. I ran. I have the car that I have. I have a car that I raced in '96 that I'm going to put back together. It's won one race. Like who restores a car that's only won one event? Right. It ran 16 races at Florence in 1996 and ran second to robert 14 of those races i believe it uh you know when he was and so that we won a race i come home walk in the shop put the trophy up on top of the lance cracker machine well, first thing i want dad to see when he comes home comes in the shop that morning he walks in looks up there sees the trophy and the first thing he says is was robert there <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't there, Dad. <laughs> he goes, well, you didn't beat him. Was he really not there? He wasn't. No, oh, He was there that night, and yeah. we won. But, um, yeah, I, uh, Robert Powell, Charlie, and, and, and that whole family, man, it's, uh, it was, it was, it taught me a lot racing against them because they were so hard to beat. So, um, you, around this time, you get to work on Mark McFarlane's cars. Yep. Yeah. So that was 99. And then, um, 2000 is when is is actually it turned out to be much more ironic than it seemed at the time but that's when nascar's diversity program was all spread all over the country every there was different race teams that represented each one of these drivers and at townsend the house car we had an opportunity to be one of those um through a guy named sam belneves that was you know a player at roush at the uh -huh. time 
And Rick came to me after this Martinsville race and said, I think you're ready to, to crew chief this car and, and to take care of it. And we're going to build it, but we're going to keep it here and we're going to race it all season. And you're going to be responsible for everything from the truck to the drinks in the cooler to the car itself. And so <clears throat> that was my first real opportunity to do something like to crew chief something, to be in charge of something, to have something that was mine, mm -hmm. you know, sink or swim. And, and Rick didn't let me do it by myself. He, he was there with me. Um, but it was kind of my deal. So we had some luck with that. We actually won, um, at, uh, in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Um, it was the first race that program had ever won. And then that lured Mark, the fact that we had these house cars now, because Mark was kind of like, uh, at the time in 2000, 2001, he was like, he was going to drive for whoever had the hot lit car at the time or whoever was going to help him the most. Cause they were trying, it was a family run deal and they were trying not to spend everything they made. Um, and we never could get him in one of these Townsend cars. Cause that was like, that was definitely one of our things. We didn't give anything to anybody. Like everybody paid the same price. Nobody was getting anything for free. Like we didn't, Rick and Ricky didn't feel like they had to give anything away to put the best in their cars. Yeah. So once there was this house car program and there was a little bit more to it, that's how we got Mark in the Townsend car. And, and then Mark and I, you know, were the same age, had, a, you know, really similar ideas on what we wanted to do with life, which was nothing but race. Um, and we were both willing to do no matter what, no matter how much work it took. It was kind of unspoken. It just happened. But he never left my side and I wasn't leaving his and we just won everything there was to win. Yeah, y'all uh, won the national championship together. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark McFarland would, would end up driving for Junior Motorsports um, at, at one point in his career, and then he goes on later uh, in his career as a really successful crew chief himself mm -hmm. in the K&N Series and, and, and working with Ty Gibbs and other drivers. Um, but uh, you, Mark moves to Charlotte. He's going to go drive a truck. Yeah, right. so part of winning that Dodge Weekly Racing Series was you got an opportunity to drive a Dodge truck. Right. Yep. And so he, he's going to take that opportunity, and mm -hmm. he goes down south to do that. Uh, you go back to Rick's, Rick Town. I had never left. Yep. You never left. So, so the house car was there. Yep. So all the time that Mark and I were racing, it was all – that's why I say you, you, we worked. Yeah. It was all at night and on the weekends. I still worked 7 to 5 and building then, chassis uh, for Rick. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And so, um, I bought a car from y'all. Mm -hmm. I've been racing y'all at Rick's cars since the mid nineties, but yep. I bought a car from y'all, um, uh, because of my appreciation for, for Rick and, 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 and Ricky Dennis and, and, um, just the good quality cars that they were. Uh, we started racing TJ majors Yep. and, uh, we, ba we basically, so we built a street stock car for TJ. He ran that for a year at Concord. And then we're like, all right, it's time to go late model stock racing. We'll buy a car. Willie uh, Jackson, my, my, my mom's husband, was going to manage all that for me. And we'd send him down the road to race. Um, we had a lot of different people trying to help make that thing work, and we struggled. Yep. Um, I didn't know much about how to get them to where they needed to be. And... Um, uh, we would bring the car to you, uh, and and you would always kind of straighten us out. Yep. So so help help me understand where we are at that point. Yeah. So we built that car, and I remember the first time we went and tested at Orange County and had Timothy Peters yep. drive it first, and it was like TJ wasn't that much that far off no. Timothy, and and at the time Timothy was like the guy at Orange County. So we all kind of left with you know some high hopes, and um, it was you know I I've described it before as it was kind of a, a cycle. We would, we would get the car and kind of hand it off to you guys, and TJ would go run third, and then he'd run fifth, and then he'd run eighth, and then the phone would ring, and we'd get the car back. And then he'd go <laughs> run second, and then he'd run fifth, and then he'd run tenth, and then we'd get the car back. And, you know, TJ called one day. I'll never forget it. I was, had a wheelbarrow full of door bars that, like, I was putting on the shelf because at the time I had transitioned to, you know, building chassis, but I was also, like, kind of in charge of a lot of inventory and dealing with customers and, you know, now we have portable phones and so like I wore one at work and when the phone would ring and someone needed setup advice like Rick was you know overwhelmed with there was too many people calling now like it, the business was really running yeah um so I was kind of doing parts of, of that 
and the phone rings and I answer it and it's TJ and he was looking for someone to come work on his car and like there was a part of me that meant it and there was a part of me that was just being a smart ass and was like I'll come do it and was like didn't really think much of it and he asked if I was serious and I said yeah sure like you know I, at that point I felt like um not that I needed to cash in on the success that Mark and I had had but Mark was down here in Charlotte and I wasn't and it was kind of like driving me nuts cuz I you know I knew that that we were capable of doing some some great stuff yeah. not just me and him but like him and then me um so I needed to go so like like I said part of it was being a smart ass but part of it I meant and luckily somebody else called me back who <laughs> your sister yep yeah so Kelly calls you, and y'all sorted it out. I mean, how hard was that decision? How hard was it to go tell Rick? What, what were their thoughts? So, yeah, it was it was, it was was interesting because, like, we had done a bunch of – not a bunch, but we had done quite a bit of testing with Kelly, right, to where, like, I didn't um, – it wasn't that strange to be talking to her on the phone, right? Like, we had gone to South Boston and tested with her when she drove a couple times. So, like, I knew her a little bit um, to where I was comfortable enough to, like, talk about all the things that you know concern me yeah um and and you know truth be told like i don't have to tell you this but you guys took really good care of me during that whole process like i was married and owned a house and um you know made us feel like part of the family from day one the it the hardest part even harder than telling my parents and my sister um was telling rick like i couldn't get the words out of my oh mouth oh my gosh like the <laughs> Earlier, you know, in, in 98, like it was the, the comp, you know, I didn't have the position I had at Townsend when I left to go work for Junie. Um, and the company wasn't doing like competitively. It was always doing well, but it wasn't doing as good as it was the second time. Um, I felt like I was leaving him and Ricky in a pickle and, um, you know, that was hard. Yeah. Um, Rick is this bearded, big, big dude. Big dude. He's like Santa Claus. It's yeah. like a, one of the elves yeah. telling Santa yep. he's going to have to leave. But he actually told me when I told him why I was leaving that if I didn't leave, that I wasn't near as smart as he thought I was and that he would fire me. <laughs> so, so it definitely it ended like, you know, relieved, yeah. but I, I'll never forget it. I sat in his office. He had a picture of him and Mike Beam and Butch Lindley like down there shopping in Greenville behind him from the from the late yep from the long time yeah, ago from the early 80s i guess and it was like it just i don't know what happened but nothing would come out of my mouth and like you know just tears and yeah. it was a mess like i felt like i was leaving my own dad oh yeah yeah all right so um you come to mooresville yeah all right what was your first impressions when you walked in the shop i mean you you weren't unfamiliar with the shop but no and and i don't it's hard to explain without sounding like you know you ain't just gonna hurt arrogant. My Forget I'm here. No, it's not about yeah. you. It just it there was nothing about it that I didn't think that this was just going to be easy. Like it's just a late model. It just had a different address, right? We were going to go to the same racetracks. We were going to race the same people. Um, you know, now we're just going to do it with TJ. Yeah. And and the car is orange and instead of red, but yeah. like it was the exact same car. I literally built that car, like the chassis from the ground up, the rear end, every piece of it other than the internal parts of the motor, I built it. So I knew it like the back of my hand. Um, you know, I knew, and nothing against anybody that had worked on it, but you get a bunch of people that are, you know, that friends and they all want to come help. They've all got different opinions and you kind of mix it all together and it's just not going to work, right? It's like individually, any one of them probably could have made that car go faster. And that was kind of the opportunity that I had. There was nobody else. Yeah. It was just me. Like I was in that room by myself, me and Willie. And, you know, Willie was like, he was willing to do anything I asked to help, but he wasn't going to tell me sure. what to do on the car. No. Um, and he didn't, which I really appreciated. Like, and, you know, it, it probably didn't go appreciated enough that he let people do their jobs, but I changed everything and just put it back. But I knew what was right. Like we had one car with races with those type cars all over the country. So like, it sounds arrogant, but I didn't come down here with, like, there was not an ounce of me that was nervous. I just wanted to go racing. Yeah. How'd it go? <laughs> it went pretty good. I think uh, I think it was the fifth race we ran. We went to South Boston for, that was kind of the deal we made. You didn't want us camping out at a racetrack. So I was a little jealous when your late mile program progressed, and then you guys started camping out at Hickory and all these places. <laughs> it was like, dang, we had to move all over the place. Yeah. So we uh, our deal was three races and then move on. 
So we went and ran our three at, at South Boston and progressively, you know, better each week. I think, you know, TJ got to understand me and, and he was, um, you know, he was like that part of his career and his age where like trust was a big thing yeah. and he was trying to figure out who he could trust and who he couldn't. Um, and the second stop was motor mile and we went up there and, and we didn't just win. It was a, they had a, it was a big money race. They had yeah. a bounty on Frank Denny Jr. Which was like another Richmond guy that like, there was nobody better to beat than Frank Denny Jr. He's always, you know, barking and, you know, talking about how great he was and, and we won and took all his yeah. money and it was great. Like Denny Hamlin was in that race. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the thing about TJ, you, you, you mentioned it. We, t we went to, we took that car brand new, tested it orange county and ran third in his very first race mm -hmm. in that car yep and uh i was like oh man we're gonna be good mm -hmm. third um and tj had tj did have real ability absolutely right did ha he had it um the one thing that tj didn't have was a filter and and an ability to to button it up his mouth mm -hmm. when 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 he needed to <laughs> does he now <laughs> yeah i don't think so i don't think he's learned that but he's got the, he's earned the right to be the way That's he right. is now but back then we were like hey you know um and so things there was a uh i remember you might remember it differently i remember we're coming up on there was an announcement there would be a late mile stock race at bristol and i remember thinking damn i don't know if tj needs to go run that Mm -hmm. And I was like, I think we need, we need to, t I need to tell TJ that he, he probably can't run that race. I don't know what we're going to do. And that pissed TJ off. Yeah. And TJ really, really got annoyed by that. And then I got annoyed by his reaction to it. I'm like, well, this is my damn car and I don't think you're going to run Bristol. I don't want it. I don't want you to go up there and run it. Yeah. And we ended up getting in a bit of a spat about it and we called Mark and Mark would end up getting in the car. Yeah. Is that pretty much the sequence of events? That no, that's – yeah, I mean, I think everyone recognized that putting a late-mile stock around Bristol at the time was dangerous, yeah. right? Like the cars – It's um, not made for that kind of – They're not made for that kind of stuff. No. And that race was originally – that was the old UARA Stars Tour, and that's yeah. what it was supposed to be was like the most elite late-model drivers in the country. Um you know, it, it wasn't made for the ones that were learning how to do it. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much exactly how I remember it. And, and I don't know that I really ever knew what was after Bristol for TJ. Right. But I do remember his reaction, and I remember thinking, I get it, but you're going to regret it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, it was, it was a while. Like, it was a bumpy road there for a minute, you know, getting, you know, for TJ to understand. But I think there was – I always felt like there was a part – that you know everybody's got a place in this sport yep. and i think you know maybe you had kind of started to realize that that might not be his place yeah. in the seat but that there was something bigger for him out there and, and obviously like he's found it right sure like, he's awesome so we we called um mark yep mark was in between jobs mm -hmm. and uh we said hey mark mcfarland come drive this car we got this four race sort of schedule we're gonna do in a solid month yep um, I know Nashville Fairgrounds was one of the races. Y'all didn't want to go there. Nope. But I was like, please go run that race. I want to win. I want a car that can go win a race there. Yep. Um, you ran three other places, and we we got forty grand in four weeks. Yep. Total. Yeah. And then we were like, all right. Yeah. We're done. Mm -hmm. Um. What do you remember after that? Yeah. So we we went on that little tear. Yep. The Nashville thing always stuck out because they had a different motor rule there. And our motor was supposed to be not competitive. Um, and not because of, of who built it, just because of the rules. Yeah. <clears throat> and I remember going, calling some friends that raced there and getting lap times. And we had just gotten this new toter home, right? Like it was like fancy and it was beautiful. And we get in it and we drive to Nashville. And, and I don't remember what the lap times were. They said you were supposed to run, but we were like a second quicker. And I thought, ah, these guys are lying to us. And we just kept working. And it was like, Mark's like, ah, like, no, they're lying. Like, we just work, work, work. All day we worked. That's all we did was work on this car. Slept in the toter home when the guys showed up the next morning, like, sign in Saturday morning. Like, there's these, you know, two or three bums from North Carolina that, like, slept in the parking lot. <laughs> the thought of going downtown Nashville and, like, you know, having a beer, listening to, like, it never crossed our mind. Like, right. we were just racing. And uh, 
they weren't lying. That is as fast as they could go. <laughs> and like we had worked our fingers to the bone and were just lightning fast. And it was the one and only time that Mark and I ever had any, and it was comical. It wasn't heated at each other, but it was the one and only time there was ever any animation on the radio. He had such a big lead. All I could think about was that they're going to tear this thing down to the last nut and bolt and you're going to expect us to race again in six days. And it's like, dude, slow down. Like, you've got to slow down. Like, and, and he finally came over the radio, and he was like, you know, if I go any slower, I'm going to wreck this piece of shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we won by a country mile, do the whole thing. Like, got the coolest trophy. Like, it gave the, it gave the, the grandfather clock at Martinsville a run for its money. Oh, like, yeah. this big bronze eagle. And we go to tech and like I'm sweating bullets. Like we're gonna be there till the sun comes up. Like they hate us, right? And you know, the guy comes over and he says, Is it legal? And I'm like, Yeah, built it myself, it's legal. And he gave us a case of Schaefer's oil and told us not to ever come back. And that was it. No sh <laughs> So there was like no tech. There was nothing. <laughs> we like got this case of oil, we got this cool trophy and a big check and and you know, back to Mooresville we go. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, but they told us not to ever come back. The wait is over, NASCAR fans. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, is officially live in North Carolina. And right now, new customers get $250 in bonus bets guaranteed when you bet your first five bucks. Just go to FanDuel.com slash Dale to sign up. Then you can bet on everything from individual race winners to prop bets to which drivers are going to take home the championship, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Start your engines with $250 in bonus bets when you place your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Dale to get started. FanDuel, authorized gaming operator of NASCAR. 21 plus and present in North Carolina. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 877-718-5543 or visit morethanagame.nc.gov. I want to. I want you to help me bridge the gap. We we do get to the Xfinity series eventually, mm -hmm. but there was uh, there was a lot of racing we did in between then, yeah. between the late model and the Xfinity series. So tell that story. Yeah, we. Uh, so after we did all the late model stuff, it was, you know. I think your exact words were, I'm not going to pay you two to go around the East Coast and beat up on these late-mile guys anymore. So it was, what are we going to do? And it was the, the choice. There was the Hooters Pro Cup Series, which ended up being, like, the coolest racing still to this day I've ever done. Really? Like, maybe excluding the Rolex 24, the Indy 500 or something like that, but, like, just short track racing, like, the people that did it were just awesome. And it was so hard, mainly because Mark and I were clueless of what was going on, but – it was just fun or arca racing and you know we decided to go pro cup racing so we built a couple cars uh got them from steve levitt got some motors oh yeah we did yep. get levitt's cars yep. got some <laughs> I motors from... we get levitt's car we had those in the cup series yeah i was yeah. running them on my cup cars on the front clip they that levitt's clip was yep, the that's, new thing. That was a thing and he and he was awesome like i remember begging rick to build these cars like i had this like pipe dream in my head that I was going to go back to Richmond for like a month. We were going to build these two pro cup cars, just me and Rick. It was going to be like the good old days. Like that's why our late model program in my mind was so successful. Cause like I had built it with my own hands. I had never really at this point in my life, I'd never raced a car that I didn't build, like literally build, like not just yeah. assembled from the box, but like built the chassis. So there was a part of me that was a little leery of like how this was going to go down. And I just, Rick wasn't having it. Like he had built pro cup cars before. Um, he had kind of been burnt by the rule book like we had before i moved here like the most dominant pro cup cars there were and they changed the rule book and made him illegal so he was just not going to deal with it <clears throat> so he had kind of like seconded the vote to go to levitt so that's how we ended up there yeah. um had some motors from automotive specialists and the only real requirement you had was that we hired your uncles to put the bodies on which you know I'll, ne I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Robert and Yeah, Yep. So we go over to their shop over in Concord, and they're like – My gosh. <laughs> we we got a – you know, it was like, hey, they had a spec greenhouse and a nose and tail, and then the rest of it was like a free-for-all. Yes. And so go over there and meet them. And, like, I knew who they were, but I didn't know them personally, right? And, like, when you meet them, <laughs> they're characters, right? Yes. Like they're a blast from the past. And oh, yeah. 
Um, and they're really not into someone like they don't want to hear my crap, right? Like they're going to do their thing and they don't need me. And like, I'm yeah. just a fly on the wall. So I'm like, can you do this? Yeah. Have you ever done it before? Nope. And I'm like, oh, this ain't good. <laughs> they're like, what do you need? A rule book. That's it. Yeah. Just give us a rule book. How about a template? Nope. Just the rule book. I'm like, okay. So we dropped these cars off. And one thing I did learn in this process is you're not going to rush them because they're not going to hurry up for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we got this first car. Like, if we needed it a month before the first race at Lakeland, we got it like two weeks before. Yeah. And they really didn't see the problem with it or care. Yeah. <laughs> so we put this thing together. We go test it. And it was kind of like the Nashville story all over again. Like, we went down there and, you know, you're racing against Shane Huffman and Clay Rogers and Jay Fogelman and, you know, Bobby Gill and just like the who's who of short track racing. And like, we were faster than all of them. And we're like, ah, they're lying to us. Like, yeah. there's no way. Like, there's no way we're faster than they are. So we come back to from the test and go back down there to race. And I never forget it. We rolled it through tech, and there's like 60 cars would show up these races. And and um, our car was wrapped and not painted, which was unique at the time. Um, they pulled it out of the tech line. All, there's all these cars in the tech line, and they come through there and they took ours out. And it's like what? And it looked a little bit different. There was a little bit, but not like a ton, but it yeah. was different. And they're checking the body. They were convinced that the fenders were carbon or that, you know, like it just didn't look like all the rest of them, but, <laughs> but it was, and it fit and the magnet stuck. Cause it was like, it was, everything was by the rule book. It was just the G's <laughs> interpretation of the rule book was better than everybody else's. <laughs> so That's we great. ended up being like the fastest car in practice. We sat on the pole. We're like, dominating the race and the motor blows up oh, like, ah, the things you can't control yeah. but it just kind of went on from there and we had a lot of luck i think we sat on nine poles and sat three track records and we only won one race though the whole pit stop thing was like throw mark and i for a loop like we were used to late model racing and they dropped the green flag and it's like you know you're on your own go race i'm gonna clean up the trailer and wait for you in tech shed all these guys had come down pit road and and they made their cars better like they understood about putting these tires and you know these radial tires in different sets to like adjust the stagger as the track rubbered up all these things that you know i learned later on in life but mark and i are just like what the heck is going on like yeah and we're so fast and and we qualify so good and we kick their butt in the first half of the race and then we finish second finish third like every week we're second we're third we're we're leading the points we're doing all this stuff but like we can't win and we weren't really used to not winning especially not together yeah so that was that was difficult but there was a big chunk of money that paid for leading halfway, so we just take that and go home. <laughs> <laughs> so we end up, um, I we end up we me and Kelly end up. Uh, there's really it's me, Kelly, and Steve Crisp, and and you, mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Uh, Mark worked there as well. A couple other people here and there, but we got a call from the Navy, and the Navy says, "Are y'all interested in starting an Xfinity team? We're looking around for for a new team." Mm -hmm. uh, they offered. Uh, enough money for us to get something off the ground um, and so we decided literally like just just sitting here like this all right we're gonna I guess we're gonna do this everybody mm -hmm. in favor yeah sounds great um, we I don't remember where we got our trailer I think we bought it from Nimichek we didn't have a trailer for the first race yeah we got the trailer for the second year from Nimichek. Yep. yep so our first hauler i guess was Nimichek. what did we we borrow one from somebody we or use our own so the first race that we ran was homestead yes and we went and tested that was when you could go test yep and truex was running for the championship with their deal uh we got the car from the 15 team yeah the car was one of paul menard's bush cars that's correct yeah yep and uh we took our toter home to the test gotcha and Mark and I drove it. Like, it was just like, we're going pro cup racing, but we're going to do it at Homestead instead of Lakeland. Like, yes. hey, it's no different, right? Yep. It's going to be great. So we get down there and we got, you know, Hovis and Mark's cousin, Travis worked with us at the time. And, and, uh, we get there for the test and it's like, you kind of look around and you're like, well, this is not pro cup racing. Like there's some big names here and some, you know, like beautiful equipment, fancy trailers and all this stuff. And like, we're still doing our own grocery shopping for the Toter home. So the trailer beside us was the JTG Bush team and they roll their car out and forgot to put the chalks on the lift gate. Oh, 
and dropped the back tires off the lift gate and it landed on the exhaust pipe and it was kind of just dangling. And I remember Mark and I looking at each other and we were like, well, we might be dumb, but we're not that dumb. We'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we just kind of went from there and, and we actually had a really good test. Like we couldn't stop smoking the left front tire through the fender and we had really no idea why it was doing it like until we got home and um, had some people with a lot more experience tell us what was happening. But nevertheless, it was fast. Like yeah. the car was, I think we definitely outpunted our coverage with that whole thing. Just yeah. making it up as we went along. I remember the race. Um, I remember sitting on our pit box and looking down pit road, and us had, we had the smallest pit box of anybody. Uh, so but, it was all Schrader stuff. That's to answer your question. That's where the trailer came oh, from. Oh yeah, for Homestead. We, we borrowed. Yep, yeah, we Kenny borrowed Schrader's. Schrader's trailer. Wow. And some of his people. Yes. Like his people were his pit crew on that I truck deal. All of that. Yeah. Holy. Sh and he. We just literally asked him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was a buddy deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Holy. Sh yep. Oh, I forgot all about that. And so I just remember sitting there, and it was just me and you on that pit box. Mm -hmm. And Mark ran like 20th all night. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. I remember um, I remember we run like 20th all night, but like the top, you know, 10th to 20th were like all on the same straightaway. Like it was. Yeah, and the end result doesn't really show. <laughs> no. He got a flat tire on the last lap yeah. and lost like. I think he was running about 14th yeah. and finished whatever 17th or 18th. Or I remember we were watching him race, uh, and he kept he would had he had a habit at least that night <laughs> of driving down the straightaway looking looking on the left side of the car in front of him. And I'm like, I tap you on the side, and I'm like, he's like a half a car length off the wall down the straightaway. And it's like he just was in the habit of like driving down the straightaway. Like mm -hmm. I don't know why he wasn't used to having somebody in front of him. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> he used to be able to see where he could go. Yeah. yeah, I just remember that, and I was like, "Man, Mark, Mark, can you get up on the straightaway? Get up against the wall." Yep. Um, but that was our introduction to um, mm -hmm. the Xfinity series. We got to run. We agreed to do this deal with the Navy the next year, but we got all the equipment and forced ourselves to get to homestead to run the final race that's right it gave us this sort of <clears throat> understanding of what we're getting ourselves into then you've got this off season where you're going to build our affinity team mm -hmm. right yep that was the plan how'd that go not real well <laughs> yeah it didn't uh i don't think it turned out the way that that i expected it to anyway um you know we hired a bunch of people and it was like that deal um had been it was a close knit group of people, right? Like we had Mark's cousin, Hovis, who was like a really good friend of yours. Um, and we had kind of done everything together. And now there was all these new people um, that had come in. And individually, like some of them were great. Like some of them were, you know, like really good. But there was others that kind of, you know, they didn't necessarily want to listen to someone as young as me, right? Yeah. Like that was the roadblock. Like, you know, what have you done? Nothing, but we're going to do something. And it was, you couldn't really understand the people that, we're coming from these big cup teams. You know, like Dale Jr. started an Xfinity team. You could get people from anywhere you wanted, right? Like people were quitting big teams to come work there. They didn't want to listen to a guy that had late mile stock car raced his whole life. Yeah. So, you know, it was tough. Um, I remember, you know, I'd spent a lot of time with Robert and Jimmy because by then I had kind of gotten close with them. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think they knew that I was serious and that, that I could do this if I'd just be left alone. Um and and you know there was some there were some people that that got opportunities in my opinion there that honestly didn't deserve them, um, and then it didn't take long to weed them all out. Yeah. But I wasn't necessarily there for all of it. But they all they weeded themselves out. The ones that belong there are still here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so midway through the year, Mark gets hurt. Yeah. Mark's driving the car. Um, we're actually getting a little traction. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're starting to see a bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. But right. When Mark gets hurt, it was a big setback for the team. Yeah. What do you remember about um, your final, you know, six months with Junior Motorsports? So I knew that Mark getting hurt was a bigger deal <clears throat> than just Mark getting hurt. Like, physically, he was going to recover for it, from it, right? Like, he had, he had been hurt in cars or in life before, and, and he was fine. The problem was... Martin Truex Jr., who was a two-time Xfinity champion, and Robbie Gordon, who would drive the wheels off anything, were who was going to replace Mark. And the experience alone that they had was going to help accelerate everything, right? Like maybe the fact that 
the cars weren't being set up correctly was going to get exposed. Maybe the fact that the crew chief might not have been the best person for that job, Truex was going to expose it, where Mark didn't know. Mark didn't know what was right or wrong. Like, that's yeah. how him and I had raced. Like, we just raced and learned as we went. <clears throat> so all these things were going to get – they were getting ready to come out, right? Like, everyone that, that – that was pulling the wool over their eyes and pointing their finger at Mark, which there was a lot of it. Um, they were getting ready to get exposed and all this stuff was magically going to get fixed at the expense of Mark's injury. Right. And honestly, at the end of the day, that's kind of what happened. Yeah. So why did you decide to leave? What happens? Um, I don't think it was a hundred percent my idea. Yeah. Um, it wasn't in the plan for sure. Um, but, you know, once you guys had released Mark, there was obviously I took it personal, right? Like it was, it was, um, I didn't, I knew what was happening in that shop probably better than everybody. And I, there was people there that wanted, you know, you to think that every day was sunny and that there was rainbows everywhere. And that wasn't the case, but they had a bigger voice than I did because they had more experience or a longer resume. <clears throat> so when, when Mark got let go, I probably wasn't the best employee that you had ever had. Right. Like from that point on, cause I took it, it was hard for me. Yeah. The, the saving grace of it was got to go pro cup racing with Johnny Rumley, which was awesome. Like, yeah. so that went really well and, and I enjoyed it. But when it was all said and done, you know, there was a massive divide between me and everyone in that Xfinity shop because I knew, I knew what had happened, and there was to this day I'm not gonna sure. pardon any of those people. Yeah, um, they took an opportunity from somebody that's probably one of the greatest short track racers we've ever seen. Um, so I think somewhere along the line, you know, in the meantime, um, my dad had passed away. So I was angry in general, um, had never really dealt with it as I, I went home for a l brief amount of time and, you know, I, I had my sister and a mom take care of, and I did that, but, uh, I just wanted to go back racing and that was what was going to fix everything. And now that was a mess. And there was only one person that I would ever call that would fix it and I couldn't call him. So it just snowballed, right? Who? Your dad. My dad. Yeah. yeah. So... Somewhere along the line, the the conversation came, we're going to expand the late model stock car program because it had kind of sat idle during the time of the Pro Cup cars yeah. and the growth of the Xfinity. We're going to bring it back, get some new people in, maybe even have two of them, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I just remember thinking, like, I didn't move away from my family and, and not get to spend the last years of my dad's life with him to late model stock car race for the rest of my life. Like, I could have done that in Virginia. I could have done it with Rick. Like I didn't, I don't need this. So I'm not doing that. Like the deal was I promised that we would win late mile races and I promised that we could pro cup race and, and, and in return, I wanted to be a crew chief. Like I wanted to be a crew chief at the national series level. So I felt like that promise was being broken. I had held up my end of the bargain and now I'm not getting what because my connection i'm getting drugged down with what happened to mark yeah basically so yeah it was uh it was a rough day yeah yeah there's stuff i left at your shop that i never came back and got just because i didn't want to come back this is probably still there <laughs> yeah those are um those are not easy uh those are never easy they're easy when people deserve it yeah they're easy it's a sense yeah. of relief but when they don't it's tough yeah yeah you let all right so after you leave junior motorsports um where do you go from there so <clears throat> through the pro cup stuff i had met jeff foltz and you know i really didn't know what i was going to do um i was really good friends with a guy named matt miller who ended up becoming a pretty big player in some arca and k n stuff down here um but he has a very successful business back home um and he was actually one of the first people I reached out to, uh, you know, had a, had a young, young son, had a house, like had never really, you know, found myself in that position. And so like first box you got to check is make sure you got something 
right? So it was like, yeah, come on home. You can work for me. But I didn't want to go home. <laughs> um, so Foltz had needed someone the very last race of the year for the Pro Cup stuff back then was at Iowa. And actually it was Iowa then Myrtle Beach. And he wanted he needed a crew chief. Whoever was helping him was no longer helping him. And I thought, you know, like I said, back I was a different person back then. I was a little angry, had chip on my shoulder, like was just full of myself. And I thought there's no better way to stand my ground than to go to these last two Pro Cup races and beat that junior motorsports car. Like <laughs> yeah. we're gonna we're gonna beat Johnny Rumley. That's what we're gonna do. And yeah. then I'm gonna be able to walk away and feel like I've accomplished something. So we ran those two races, Iowa. Uh, that was the big tire debacle. Like, no one could finish. People were putting tires on. Woody Howard won on a set of tires from the Bristol race. Like, it was a mess. It was fun, but it was a mess. Yeah. Um, went to Myrtle Beach, and Foltz took the white flag leading, and Benny Gordon wrecked him in three and four. And, like, we ended up fighting on pit road. It was, it was like, it was really cool. It was, like, great short track stuff. But <laughs> the, I had checked the box I needed to check because we were going to win that race, and we were going to beat that 88 car. And, like, to me, that was all that mattered. My car. Your car. Yeah. Yeah. We go beat it. So through that, at the time, Foltz was the setup plate guy at MB2 on the 01 car. And MB2 was talking about starting an Xfinity team. <clears throat> so he introduced me to a guy named Doug Randolph. Yep. And if there was anyone – that could give a Rick Townsend a run for their money of somebody that's done the most for me in my career, it's Doug Randolph. Wow. Um, so he introduced me to him, and I'll never forget, it was like the second interview, he said he was looking for a car chief. And I'm like, okay, I didn't even know what a car chief was. So I'm like, sure. And he asks if I could do it. And I'm like, look, man, I don't know, but I can do it all. Like, I'm used to driving the truck, setting them up, building them. Like, I don't know what small percentage the car chief does, but – yeah, it sounds like sounds easy. I'll do it. Yeah, and I I don't know why, but he hired me. And um, so anyway, we we went on a run together and put that Xfinity program together. Who drove it? Uh, Regan Smith and Craig Kenzer, which was like really cool because I ended up getting to I ended up getting to ARCA race with Craig Kenzer and later on in my career Kevin Swindell. So like growing up watching Thursday Night Thunder, now I'm racing with like you know Steve and Sammy's sons, and it was yeah. like, and they were both badasses um but what i didn't realize at the time was we basically started your late mile program from nothing we completely started your pro cup car from nothing and we started this xfinity team for nothing and it never like the light bulb that maybe like crew chiefing was like maybe there was something else i was good at like on the business side but it i didn't want to do that i didn't want to hear that but mb2 started this xfinity team from nothing well, there was one person that was part of it that had done this multiple times, and it was me, like the youngest kid in the room. So we started this whole thing and and ran, and you know, it, you know, MB two became Gin, Gin became DEI, and it was like it was just this kind of whole thing. But that was Doug gave me that chance, and he calmed me down. He taught me not because he sat me down and like gave me life lessons, but I just watched him. He knew how to treat people. He knew how to get the most out of people. He knew how to get the most out of his drivers. Um, he never yelled. He never screamed, even when things weren't going right. And I was like, man, but everybody worked, I mean, worked hard for yeah. him. So I was like, you really can get people to do stuff that you need them to do without yelling at them. Yeah. And so like, it was, he's still like one of my closest friends. And, you know, now I think when, when there's that question that, that like I would have called my dad for, like, I'm gonna call Doug now. So, and I think I'm on a list of a lot of people that do that. Yeah, you were. I've heard a lot of great things from about Doug, and um, he he is well respected in the industry. Uh, Ganassi ends up becoming the owner of that whole program, and mm -hmm. and you're still there. So you went through all of those changes from from Gin to <laughs> DEI to Ganassi. Yeah, I think one year I had four W twos and never changed desks, <laughs> like from all different ones. But yeah, yeah so we you know ended up. Um, I ended up being Sterling Marlin's cup car chief on the 14 car Yep. before the original merger. Who TJ's a spotter for. TJ was spotter for. <laughs> yep. Yep. So it goes full, full circle. circle. We don't burn a bridge. <laughs> That's right. Um, and then when they merged with DEI, they put Doug and I on the 15 car with Paul Menard, which was, which was great. Paul's a great guy. Like, that was a lot of fun. Um, definitely think it was 
the best way to to baby step your way into the DEI culture because like there was a lot of lifers there and they weren't really into this merger and who are these people and I might have had a little bit of a leg up on some of them because they recognized me from like working on your late model across the street and it was a little bit helpful um but I think if you know you'd have gotten thrown to the wolves on that eight car like they'd have chewed me up and spit me out but we went you know did the 15 and then that ended up that DEI merged with Ganassi and it was like flashbacks to the Junie Dunleavy thing. Like I knew we were in trouble. Like we, we moved to Ganassi's shop. The 15 disappeared. So now I'm the car chief of the eight. Eric Almirola is going to drive it, which we were like really good buddies and had lived together and, you know, had this whole like late model racing background together. And I was like, okay, this is going to be cool. Then you look around and there was no executives from DEI there. Nobody. That we had no representation. And it's like, oh boy, we're in trouble. Yeah. So the eight car um eventually shuts <clears throat> down and you got laid off. Yep, in April. After Texas. There damn, before the middle of the season. Yep. So what do you do then? Um so ironically, another uh, somebody that works here with you, uh Jim Pullman. Yeah. Was um he kind of was like the head of like the the engineering group at Ganassi that actually did the work, you know, like not the nothing against the ones that are on designing parts, but he was like the pull down guy and the spring guy, and he kind of made it reality. So when you would go to pull your cars down at the at Ganassi, Pullman, and Tiffany Daniels, who also is here, were the two engineers Damn. that um, took care of that stuff. Wow. So Pullman had connections with Eddie Sharp and his ARCA deal, and a guy named Steve Arpin. I think who also drove here yep. <laughs> um, was going to start this ARCA deal. And he wanted me to go. Eddie had all Ganassi cars. So it was kind of like, there are chassis, there are springs. I've got all the data. Like, go over there. This kid can drive. Make it happen. So I did. So I went over there and, like, I didn't necessarily want an ARCA race, right? Like, I'm thinking, like, uh, kind of, you know, cup car chief and yeah. like, things are going good yeah. and maybe I should do something different. Um, but Eddie had a nice place and Arpin was like pretty talented. And I just thought maybe this is what I need to do. Like I, I, I wanted, I still had in the back of my head, I wanted to be a crew chief and there is a path from being a cup car chief to a cup crew chief, but it's pretty narrow path. Right. So I said, well, I'll go do this for a while. So I went over there to Eddie's and, and, um, you know, did that deal with the Arca stuff. And then Eddie decided he wanted to have a truck team and steve park was going to drive it which was awesome like we ran a couple races with steve they put skinner in um <laughs> took steve out that wasn't as awesome uh, <laughs> why not uh, he's just tough as nails like Who? mike skinner Mike's yeah tough. like yeah. he still thought that like you know eddie's eddie's trucks like literally were the trucks that aaron crocker had driven right like it was a startup deal like he's just getting it off the ground like he didn't have the manufacturer support and and skinner was still expecting it to be like the lowe's number 31 truck and it yeah. was not going to ever be that yeah um so you know i ended up um that turned into an opportunity to go crew chief and xfinity car for for kevin conway wow yeah, the extends Chevrolet. So you did that for one year. Did it for a whole year. Yep. Yep. And then uh, Billy Hess. Yep. Yep. the The deal with Conway, um, you know, it was over there at R three. Yep. It was like it was perfect for me. Mark McFarlane was my car chief. Like we were back together oh again. Oh my gosh! Like, yeah, we were racing. Like we were having a good time. You know, expectations in reality were lined up with that program, which was kind of good for me. Um, a lot of the cars came from RCR and the engines were ECR engines sometimes. Um, and at the time, Doug Randolph was crew chief in the 29 over there, RCR. So, so like, lean on him. yep, I had somebody to lean on and everything was going really well until it wasn't. And then, you know, the, the extends money dried up at the end of the season after the last race. And, you know, R3 had a two car team, like, well, his son drove the other one. So, you know, which one they're going to keep. Right. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. So I went over to talk to Billy Hess, and Billy kind of reminded me of Rick. Um, he was, you know, old school, and he was definitely a little bit um, tougher. He was a little bit harder on people yeah. than Rick was, but a lot of this, lot of similarities. And and you know, he said, "Well, I need some help, and it sounds like you need a break." So <laughs> I went to work for Billy. What did you do? Whatever he told me to. Okay. Like we went late model stock car racing. We built a couple of those, and 
and did that. Um, he was taking care of the beard oil guy that's now does the 62 cup yep. car. He had an ARCA car that um, Clay Rogers drove. Mm -hmm. um, so we went and did a couple ARCA races here and there. Um, built yep. a bunch of K&N cars for Ben Kennedy yeah. before anybody knew who Ben was. Right. Um, which, you know, that was, it was fun. Just nothing, Doing whatever. Everything. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. So how did you get to that point in your life to where, like, going back to a late model stock race to, to help somebody was okay? So it wasn't really necessarily okay. That just happened to be what we did at the time. I haven't got to that, that crossroad yet, but I did. Um, I just needed – I was tired of changing jobs, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you go from MB2 to GIN to DEI to Ganassi and never asked for any of it. And it was like – and then you finally get out of that deal and you're ARCA racing with Eddie and he's like, oh, I want to run a truck. And it's like, this is not good. Like, you're an ARCA guy. Like, you have a great footprint here. Don't mess it up. Yeah. Like, but we're going to go try to truck race and mess it up. And that's what happened. Um, so I was just exhausted. Like, I just wanted to go have fun again. So yeah. anyway, while I was at Billy's, the phone started ringing. Um, and, and they were, you know, I didn't want to go be a car chief again, right? Like nothing against him. Um, I just, I felt like I had done enough since I had done that. That wasn't what I wanted to do. And thankfully I had Billy Hess who was providing me an opportunity that I didn't have to, right? Like I, he was giving me a great place to work and um, I was able to take my time and do what was right. But that's when, you know, that's when the, the whole eight mile crossroads came when max called back so max um is uh max siegel the 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 owner of rev racing yep so he calls you and he knows you because of the dei mm -hmm. days yep when he was general manager at dei yep he says hey man i got this general manager position at rev racing mm -hmm. that's not crew chief um so what what was in what was enticing about that idea? Not a lot at first. <laughs> it's like they were in a mess. Like yeah. they had themselves. Um, so the super short version before that, they started that deal. Almirola and I had a late model that we had built and we were going to do a little side racing with. Um, we ended up doing too good of a job building it. And Timothy Peters came and bought it before we ever raced it. So we never actually raced it, but we had this like deal going. Um, this is when... John Story and Max were going to put this rev racing. And if you go back to the diversity program being all over the country with different race teams, that wasn't working. There was no way to compare the drivers to each other because you didn't know what opportunities they were getting when they're all over the place and even what kind of cars they're driving. Yeah. Someone would be driving a modified, the next person would be driving a super late model. So Max had this idea to get it under one roof, and he had presented this idea to NASCAR, and, and they – they agreed and it was absolutely the right decision but in that process they had asked for some for some budget help and my responsibility with eric was the late mile stock car portion of this so now eric's driving the eight car max knew from us working at dei that i had a deep rooted background in short track racing and you know really probably is and still is where my heart is most of the days um that we put this budget together for him. And it was kind of like the first time we had ever done anything like this, right? So we go and we present this budget to John Story. And he was based here out of Charlotte. Max had moved back to Indianapolis. <clears throat> and John looks at it and reads it, and the number was higher than he wanted it to be. And there was no benefit for us to make the number what it was. It just is what it is. I mean, late mile stock racing is expensive. Um, and and I'll never forget it. He said, I believe the two of you have late mile race with a golden spoon in your mouth. And I just remember like it rubbing me the wrong way, right? Because yeah. that was kind of the deal with your car was everybody thought we were out dollaring them and we weren't. We were out working them. Like we didn't have anything that the average person racing out of their two car garage could have. We had one car. We had one, you know what I mean? We just worked. Mm -hmm. So I always took offense for a long time, it was on your behalf of people that thought we were just winning races with your money. Was, that wasn't true. But now you're like, I'm telling you what this costs. There's no benefit for this in me. You're not paying me. You're not doing anything for me. I don't work for you anymore. I'm just trying to help because 
I want to see this program succeed because if you back up to 2000, like I've already won a race with this program and it has not had a lot of success since. So they went and did their thing. And nine months later, they were in massive financial trouble. They had overstepped everything they had and like what they wanted to spend and what it cost were two different things. Yeah. And that's when Max started calling. So he talked into coming over there to, to manage. Yep. To manage the, the late program. The late it started with just the late mile stock car program. All right. So how many cars are they running at the time? Six. Oh geez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they had six late models. Um Andy Santera was running the K and M program at the time. So Andy had the the late the K and N stuff was competitively, it was amazing. They won their very first race with Daryl Wallace. Um I think they won maybe two more that year, um, with Daryl. Uh, the other other kids that were running the K&N cars were all competitive. Yeah. Um, now, financially, it wasn't doing as well. Like Andy, Andy raced it the way he knew it needed to be raced, and he raced it off the promises that were made to him, and they were expensive. Um, the late model program was a different story. Like it was just a mess. It was a train wreck. The cars were <laughs> were a mess. The the motors were a mess. Like everything about it was just bad really bad um but the debt was what blew me away um so anyway that was the problem was when it was like okay i didn't want to do this 10 years ago i didn't want a late mile stock car race for a living because i had all these things that i wanted to accomplish but now i kind of accomplished them like i felt like i had checked a lot of these boxes and Maybe I needed to admit, remind myself how fun racing was. And I knew late mile stock car racing, I'd be able to remind myself how much fun it was. Yeah. So I did fear that there's this whole out of sight, out of mind element to racing where if I'm not present in the cup garage or the bush garage that like I was going to get forgotten about, um, which I think is real. But it also forced me to be – the best thing that ever happened to that program because I had no choice but to make it work. So I treated it like it was mine, not Max's. I treated the money like it was mine, not Max's, like, and was determined to make this work. Yeah. Um, and I was there probably six months when after the, basically after the first season, I might be missing it by a month or two, but um, Andy had had enough <laughs> and, and he left. And then it was, what what are we gonna do? And yeah, I just told Max like I got it. You just don't worry about it. You know he's he's got um, a really he's really successful outside of racing, and he needed to concentrate on that because he was making some massive gains with USA Track and Field at the time. Yeah. And so I just told him, you know, you go do your thing. I'm gonna do my thing, and I promise you success. So um, you ever saw? Uh K, uh, the Rev Racing's K and N series or Real and All American series late model in their Legend programs. Um, how long did that happen? Ten years. Jeez. Ten years. Yeah. You're like the Forrest Gump. Yeah. NASCAR. Uh, <laughs> you got, yep. Like it's, ten years. How did you? It's like you lived eighty years already. I know. Right. <clears throat> I started when I was super young. Yeah. yeah. And so Rev Racing, you know, it is a reputable, functioning, successful program. It goes to the racetrack, it runs well, yeah. it wins races, yeah, and it serves an incredible, incredibly important purpose in the NASCAR industry. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've won two or three creating, truck races this year and yeah. half the cup races with their graduates. Yeah, and they're creating opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and t- So talk about that. So <clears throat> as someone who has lived that program, mm-hmm. right, talk about how important – the purpose of that program is to give these drivers these opportunities it's everybody gets an opportunity right it's not just the drivers it's a it's a true development program and you know if you go back to 2000 that program gave me an opportunity to be a crew chief Mm -hmm. right like i wasn't one and we got that house car at townsend and i became one because of that program right so it's it's not just the drivers um i think you know whether it's the pit crew members or the people that work in the shop, you know, like Dylan Smith Mamba was, he wanted to be a race car driver and, and he could do it, 
but it just didn't seem to be panning out the way he wanted it to. But we knew there was a place for him in the sport, so we made him a mechanic, and we taught him that and had him – he he worked for me for years. Um, and look at him now, yeah. right? Like it's – it doesn't necessarily – and that was kind of the thing I tried to explain to every parent and every driver that came through there. Your place in this sport might not be in the seat, right? And maybe that was something that I learned from TJ. But there's a place for everyone here. You just have to find it. Yeah. And, and depending on how hard you're willing to look is whether you'll find it or not. How, how do you make the decision to to leave? <laughs> uh, it was tough. Um, I had so no intentions of ever leaving. Like I had, I had, um, I had seen it go from in debt to debt free. <clears throat> we won championships. We won races. Like you know, you along the way, I've been fortunate to win some cool stuff. But you go to South Boston and you win a late mile stock car race with a 16 year old girl that Philip Morris and Lee Pulliam and Peyton Sellers are all in that race and you beat them. Like it's fun. Like it's fun to know that, that you provided an opportunity for somebody that was not there without the program and the people that work there. So I had started, um, spotting more and more just, I started doing it even before I moved to Charlotte, but it was just here, there, gigs. <clears throat> and Joey Meyer, somehow, through our working together at DEI, um, he reached out and asked me if I wanted to start doing all the second spot and stuff with him. So it was with Brad, you know, Watkins Glen, Indy, whatever it was. That kind of parlayed into the one-off Xfinity races for Penske. Um, so now I kind of had my foot in the door. Brad was actually really helpful with the program. You know, there was things he could donate that, that he would through his truck team, and he was big help. Um, so, like, everything was going great. I was perfectly happy. Like, I was getting to moonlight and do this stuff over here, and I felt like I was staying relevant in those garages and never wanted to become a full-time spotter. So, like, I didn't really have to worry about, like, trying to push my way through that pile. And, yeah. and um, it was just going well. And um, Travis Geisler called me one day, and he was kind of who, like, lined up the spot and stuff with um so you know i answered didn't think anything of it he wanted to talk and there was some rumors going around that maybe joey and brad were going to go their separate ways and i was like oh boy like i really don't want to be a full-time spotter and i really don't want to upset joey yeah. like i don't i would never do that um that was a that was a tough conversation because joey thought that i was and he was pretty upset with me yeah. until he realized what was happening um, but yeah, it started out like, uh, I'm not going to burn a bridge, right? I'm gonna go have this conversation. Um, but this is not going to lure me away from rev. Like we're winning, you know, can big K and N races. I mean, we're winning at Dover and Loudon and like big places. Like, um, so he asked me to come to their bus at Charlotte in the infield, which rev racing is right behind the speedway. So it was really easy. And I texted him and told him I was there. And he said, go on inside, walk straight to the back. There's an office in the back. I'll be there in a minute. So I sling the door open like I own the place. And RP standing in there at the table signing champagne bottles from the Indy 500 win. And I'm <laughs> like, whoa, I don't think this is about spotting. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't feel like RP does the spotter interviews. So anyway, that's kind of how it came. And, and it wasn't about spotting. What was it about? Uh, they were looking for a team manager for their NASCAR side. And ultimately, there's three of us. There's a... There's an IMSA version of me, there's a NASCAR, and then there's an IndyCar. Um, and they were looking to, um, you know, hire somebody for the NASCAR side. Yeah. So that was kind of what it was about. And it was still surprisingly, um, it was a very hard decision because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like every one of those employees at Rev, which, which Jimmy G was one of them, right? Yeah. Like your uncle was... He um he worked for me for five or six years, right? Like those were people I hired. Those were people that I gave my word that you're gonna get paid and we're gonna have fun and we're gonna win races. I can't control that if I don't work there anymore. So like there was a part of me that I felt like I was breaking that promise. Yeah. To them. What would happen if you left? What would happen if I left? Yep. Um Max and I had 
a partnership that's more like a brotherhood, and it still is. Um, he never questioned a thing I did, and I didn't question anything he did. Um, we just we had a plan. We stuck to it. Uh, we had provided a lot of opportunities, put a lot of pit crew members and drivers in the national level, um, and there was really no stopping it. So it was a tough decision. Yeah. And, you know, lots of people were like, ah, you're crazy. This isn't a tough decision. But they didn't know how emotionally connected I was to what Max and I were doing. Um, so believe it or not, I called Kelly. My sister. And, yeah. And, um, you know, time heals everything, right? So, like, I remember who sat at the table um, when – you know, when I didn't work at junior motorsports anymore, but enough time had passed. And like, you know, I feel like her and I had had some good conversations along the way and, you know, kids that are similar age and just things. Um, and I was like, I, I need, I need to ask you something like, and I know it's going to sound crazy, but like, I feel like her place in this sport, uh, and you know, her reputation for being brutally honest was like, it's what I needed. And I also know that she understands what it's like to be a female race car driver in this sport, right? So if anything was going to, you know, tug on the heartstrings a little bit, it's that. So I knew I'd get the truth. So I laid it all out there. And she was like, are you crazy? And I was like, no, it's like, I, it's a tough decision. So I asked her, I said, let me ask you a question. At the time... Ryan Pemberton was here, like things were rolling good, like everything was great. And I, you know, I asked her, I said, if Ryan came in tomorrow and turned in his notice and you had to make a list of people to interview to replace him, would my name be on that list? And she was like, no. And I'm like, dang, I thought we had a history. Like, come on, you can at least put me at the bottom of the list, right? And she was like, no, like, I didn't even know this is what you did. Like, I thought you were, you know, like, I didn't realize you were running an entire organization, like, for our sanctioning body. Like, it was way more than just racing. Like, sure. the, the relationships with NASCAR were, like, the best thing that came to that program for me, really. And I said, all right, well, what if I take this job? And then we have the same conversation in three years. Would I be on the list then? And she was like, absolutely, top of the list. Like, one of the top three. No questions asked. Like, anybody that comes from Team Penske is, like, you know, top of the list. I'm like, all right, well, there's my decision. Yeah. So I went home and was like, Kelly said I need to take this job. And he was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How long have you been there? This is uh, six. Six, yeah. six years. Six what full, have, working on six. And what has all happened in the six years? God, it's unbelievable, man. Like, two Xfinity championships, like – so I think, um, you know, I think that you and I have gotten along from day one because when you would come to Townsend, you know, you were Dale's son, right, to a lot of the guys that worked there. I didn't care, right? I just wanted you to go home and say, man, there's this badass that works on late models in Richmond, and he should be here. And maybe that happened a couple of years later. Same similar story happened with Austin. Like, I had no idea who Austin Sendrick's dad was. None. I spotted for Austin at all the non-companion truck races, and we were at Eldora for the truck race in the dirt, and we were going to leave there and drive to Indy to ORP to go. He was going to run an ARCA race the next night, <clears throat> and he asked me if we could take his dad um, to the racetrack, to Indy. Said, sure. So we're riding down the road, it's the middle of the night, and he asked me what I do, and I'm telling him all about what I do at Rev, and like super proud of myself, and I asked him what he did for a living. <laughs> I had no idea, like none. And I think that's just like, you know, who I was, like, right? Yeah. Like I just, Austin was a good kid, and I wanted to be a part of what he was doing because I saw something there. He's extremely intelligent. But I didn't care who his dad was, and I think a lot of people maybe did, and I didn't even know. I had no idea. So that, like, I got to be there for, I was like, Austin's first ARCA win, I spotted for him. Austin's first truck win, I was there. Austin's first Xfinity win, I was there, right? Like, I've been, got to see that. So it was like, this still this development leg that I've found this niche in. Yeah. Um, but man, since then, Daytona 500s, Indy 500s, Rolex 24s, like things that were completely unimaginable to a kid sitting in the wooden bleachers at Langley Speedway have happened. Yeah. 
I remember um, coming to the cup race and seeing you walking around in the in the pits wearing a wearing black slacks and a button down white co- college shirt with Penske on it, thinking, "How in the hell?" Mm-hmm. You know, like that is a long way from home. It's a long way from home. Um, <clears throat> you know, your story is probably not unlike a lot of people in the industry, but it's it's an it's an easier one to tell. Um, <clears throat> And I think it does answer a lot of questions for people out there who are young, people that are that kid that you were when you were working mm-hmm. over at Townsend's, wondering, man, how am I going to, How? what is the path? Like, how do I get there? It seems impossible, improbable. I don't even know where to begin. <clears throat> and so I have such a hard time telling people how to begin, right, What what to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, man, I woke up and I was plugged in right? right? because of who I am. When you get that question, how do I get into this sport? What is your answer? It's tough. I think I think the first thing you have to you have to make sure of is, is like, are you really willing to do the work or it's it's fun to talk about. It's not always necessarily cut out for everybody. Right. We're gone a lot. It's a lot of hard work you're probably going to get kicked when you're down, when you're vulnerable. Um, And then when you least expect it, the most amazing things in the world are going to happen. But most of them, I mean, the simple answer is, you know, you got to go to a short track and you got to find somebody, right? Like I was lucky. I found Rick, you know, Rick introduced me to people like Danny Edwards Jr. And people that were just local legends and kind of, they didn't necessarily, they gave me confidence, right? Like watching these, these guys. So that's, that happened. So that, that's the simple answer is you go to your short track, but nowadays probably better start with college. Really? Like, yeah. I yeah. feel like, I feel like those, those, you know, it's, it's a pretty engineering driven sport. I, I think it, it helps a lot. Um, I did not ever think that my college education was going to do anything for me, especially when I was hanging upside down in a roll cage, welding it up at Townsend's like, what good is it there? But I feel certain somewhere along the line, somebody at Penske looked to see if I was college educated. Right? Like, so yeah. it did help. It just took a lot longer than I expected. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, it's the work ethic. Like the, the, the people in this, in this industry are the hardest working human beings in the country. Like it's, it is unbelievable the the mountains that we can move. Like you look at the, the way NASCAR adapted to, to the COVID situation or the way like thousands of people in the middle of Los Angeles never blinked an eye when they were like, Hey guys, we're going to race later today. Like that wasn't on anybody's radar when we woke up that morning. Yeah. And move the clash. Yeah. And nobody cared. Like, it's just, okay, that's what we're going to do. Let's go do it. So that's the thing. Like you just got to be willing to work hard. Yeah. The sacrifice that you got to make. Um, I love telling the story about a buddy of mine, Wesley Sherrill, who works over at Gibbs now. He wouldn't, uh, dad wouldn't hire him. Dad, I mean, all dad, all I needed dad to do was give this guy a couple hundred bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And dad would not do it. Dad said, hey, if you work here, if you're here long enough to prove that you deserve it, you might get the job. And he literally had to work for more than a month without pay. Mm -hmm. And he kept coming back every day. And I was, he's like, when do you think it's going to happen? I was like, I don't know, man, but don't give up. You're almost there. I don't even, I, I, I can't even give you an answer when this right. might go, go right for you, but don't stop coming to work. And eventually it just fl- clicked one day. Dad walks in and goes, all right, you're hired, you know? Yep. And I know that's probably not the way it's going to go for everybody, but I mean, you got to be willing to do something, do it for nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not for the money, right? Right. Do I it. worked for three years for Rick for $6 an hour. Never yeah. got a raise. Not not a nickel. Didn't think anything of it. Was just happy to clock in every day. Yeah. I hired a guy <clears throat> at Rev who's still there. Awesome. He was he was willing to do anything. And and that came out of his mouth and we were heading to Iowa. And I told him, I'm like, Man, I need the help and I think you'd be great. But all the plane tickets are bought and paid for and there's no money left in the cookie jar. Like if you wanna go, if you want a job, when we get to Iowa, get in that truck. I'll see you there. And he did. Damn. That's what that's how bad he wanted to do it and and he's still employed there. Yeah. Well, man, I'm glad that you came to share today uh 
about your your life and your career and especially uncovering some of the memories from uh junior motorsports and how that all got started yeah. um and it's not always easy to talk about some of the things that happen in our lives especially the the breakup um i've had a lot of experiences here at this table with talking about some things that went down between me and michael waltrip and a few other people where um you know you're not always proud of the 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 choices you made um but i'm glad that we are friendly and close enough that we can do that yeah and i'm gonna tell you man i when i started seeing you um and hearing about these opportunities you were getting you you have to know that um you had a fan in me wanting to see you have that success and to know where you've gotten today is just incredible um but i think that it's motivation for anybody who listens uh that the the opportunities if you're willing like you say to put in their work ethic are limitless Mm -hmm. and don't be scared to go anywhere because there's not really many places that you didn't end up right right and there's not many scenarios and and working environments in the nascar industry that you didn't find yourself in and um you know so that's pretty impressive um i appreciate you your uh influence on uh yeah i mean that junior motorsports doesn't exist without you having uh you know you having the ability to help us get that off the ground you've influenced us in a positive way even today we still ride the wave of 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 how you helped us get our stuff going in the right direction yep we had a lot of fun won a lot of races together um and who know i i I don't I, I for some reason I feel like you're going to be at Penske you'll be a lifer there for for as long as you want and um it'll be surprising I guess to see you know where you end up 20 years from now uh maybe running the whole thing True. <laughs> 20 years is a long time man uh, how uh, old are you uh, 46 46 yep. you can do it yeah yeah no, I mean, it, you it, see the rest of them guys around there, you know they're older now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's a great place to be, and, and I don't really want to envision myself anywhere else, Yeah, for sure. Well, you got a hell of an opportunity to, to make that uh, something special. Yeah, and I do take a lot of – you know, it, there's a small part of me that, you know, anytime one of your cars wins, no matter – you know, there was a little bit of time where when it, – it took a while, so I did, in, I did take pride in that, but – it was a little bit of time where when you were winning all these late mile stock races, it was like, God dang, I think I've been outdone. Like we didn't win a national championship over there, but we weren't allowed to race for one either. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it doesn't, you know, there is a sense of pride that I don't, however many wind banners you stack in this shop, like there's still only one first one. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Well, I love the fact that you were part of our, um, our beginning. And um, it's interesting that you made the point to not burn any bridges because literally like all the people that you came in contact with throughout your career that, you know, that you knew some way, somehow TJ and, and, and Joey and, and Max Siegel and, you know, every, you've done a really good job of, you know, even though you have sort of, you know, you've had some unfortunate moments in your career, you've worked in a lot of different places. Those people that you had those relationships with would at times call you right mm-hmm. and 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 say hey man i i know a guy that can do this job for us yep. um that says a lot about your character you know i know you were frustrated and angry at points in your life um and what had a chip on your shoulder but to be honest i mean none, you did nothing to to ruin any relationships you ever created right. that says a lot um there's not many people out there that can say that yeah Jefferson, thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate thank you. you coming in today, bud. Thanks for everything you do for us. Yes, sir. For Jefferson sure. Hodges on the Dale Junior Download. All right, so Jefferson Hodges on the Dale Junior Download. Um, you know, I I really am glad I was able to sit here and and hear that whole story about his career and. Um, I want to thank Ally for supporting us here at at Dale at the Dale Junior Download and for and at Dirty Mo Media. Ally does a great job, uh, you know, in this industry and in our sport, and and they're responsible for bringing our guest segments every single week. Um, and no matter what you're saving for, whether it's race tickets, a brand new car, new house, doesn't matter. Uh, we're all better off with an ally. And I would say that Jefferson Hodges is definitely an ally. The um. <clears throat> The one thing that was, you know, 
not always easy is when you are sitting here with a guest at the table and and you have to talk about something that maybe didn't go as well as you'd hoped and certainly his the final end of his tenure at junior motorsports was an emotional one for him you could hear it he's still a bit you know disappointed by it um and i'm glad though that uh we are still friends today um I'm sure he wished I would have handled things differently. I'm, I'm sure he wished things would have turned out differently. I'm, I think that um, I certainly uh, may have done things differently with the experience I have today. But um, knowing everything we knew back then, we were doing what we thought was the right thing to do. And um, But it, it, it doesn't ever get easy uh, when you're sitting here and you have to kind of cover that part of the the conversation or that part of the the past um but jefferson is a, a he's a great example of just you know a grinder that eventually found his place um i meet drivers crew chiefs i meet people of all kinds of walks of life that come into this industry and they have this vision of where they want to go and who they want to be and there are times when you know that that's not going to work out you know that they're never going they're never going to achieve that vision they may find another space in this industry where they can exist and make a living and tj is a great example of that he had the talent to be a driver and it just all the pieces of the puzzle and, and the brakes didn't go that way right and he found a new lane and um richard boswell is another example right richard boswell drove our pro cup car and god he wanted to be a race car driver so badly as bad as anyone i'd ever met as bad as i wanted to be one but i knew that the you know the opportunities of that were closing and narrowing up and he had to make the decision to lean on his engineering background and his his knowledge and 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 take a new role and and he's done that as a crew chief and so you know jefferson's uh story is a great one of trying to find your lane and also not giving up but also taking opportunities maybe not the you know maybe you're getting a, a an opportunity that feels like a demotion or feels like a step back but he took those and and made them work and made them a success and um it's pretty impressive um and so glad he was able to come in today and tell us about that uh, there's a there's a lot of guys like him in the industry that have those those kind of stories, but it was a fun one for me today, um, and it brought back a lot of memories. I, a lot of that start up around junior motorsports, the late model car, the Pro Cup team, a lot of that stuff. Man, I was wide open with my own career, um, raising hell with my friends. You know, I wasn't in that shop every day seeing what was going on, and so it was great to kind of be reminded on some of the things that we did and how things went um and even my mind my mindset on like where they should race and what they should be doing but um pretty fun but uh let's get to the white flag uh on, on monday the teardown obviously with jeff gluck and jordan bianchi dropped actions detrimental with denny hamlin came out as well and door bumper clear um yesterday door uh, dirty air uh, that show is out larson Christopher Bell and Connor Zilich all called in. And today, Speed Street will drop with Connor Daly and, and Chase Holden. Tomorrow, Dirty Mo Doe with Steve Tart Gambling is legal in North Carolina. I'm hoping that, you know, that maybe uh, adds some value to Dirty Mo Doe and people can find some more um, value out of that show. I think the, the information that Steve shares with us every week uh, has been pretty incredible. And uh, they're going to be previewing the Bristol race. Also, don't forget our Thursday show, our episode of the Dale Jr. Download Reloaded will be out. Always a lot of fun. You never know who's going to call in or what these guys and girls are going to be up to. A lot of shenan shenanigans on that show. And I've actually found myself, when I'm not calling in, I'm actually finding myself listening uh, just because of the entertainment value is pretty high. So, um, uh, yeah, should be a lot of fun this week on, on, on uh, Dirty Mo Media. Also, um, one of the thing I want to give a shout out, Dalton. I guess you're um, some whoever's posting at the beginning of the week. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a JPEG of, of our, 
you know, our week full of content. Man, I'm loving that. Yeah. It's like a TV guide. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, very appreciative. It just helps everybody. It's a reminder. All the things we have going on, plus when it's happening, so people can make sure they're, they're tuning in. Buster's Trip to Victory Lane. Also, the board book is, and I have this right next to me on the table. Um, I asked for this board book to be made. They weren't, I don't think they were going to make this board book. But I got a three-year-old, and she's not into the big long-form stories that, that Buster has been here in the, in the past several uh, versions. So I thought maybe we could get a board book for those, those toddlers out there. So that uh, board book is, <clears throat> you're able to purchase your copy today everywhere books are sold. Um, and also, uh, for the Dale Jr. Uh, Foundation, if you want a chance to spend seven days on Lake Norman in our family's lake house the dale jr foundation's annual vacation at dale jr's uh, lake house raffle is underway now through april 29th purchase your raffle ticket for ten dollars you can win a stay at the lake house uh, there's boat rentals uh provided tour of junior motorsports as well uh you're going to run into me at some point during this experience uh the dale jr foundation.org uh, will give you all the details to be able to get your raffle tickets and you're just helping us raise money for the foundation that does a lot of great work um, in our community and nationally um, so thank you for anybody who who purchased a raffle ticket for that that's the wednesday show um, looking forward to bristol this weekend looking forward to everything else going on um, here at the uh, dirty mo media and hope everybody has a great week we'll see you